Production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing culture, and connecting the community to artists, events, and classes at columbusmakesart.com. From these contributing sponsors and viewers like you, thank you. This time on Broad and High, conservation through a lens uses photography to highlight critically endangered species Conservation really is a people problem. The animals didn't do anything to get themselves in this situation. A statue celebrates Akron's rubber workers, a glowing report about a Reno neon artist, plus music from Carly Frattini. This and more right now on Broad and High. Welcome to Broad and High, I'm your host, Kate Quickle. Justin Grubb was born and raised here in Columbus, but his passions for wildlife, film, and photography have taken him around the world to capture stories of critically endangered animals. His first photo exhibition, Conservation Through a Lens, is on display at the Grange Insurance Audubon Center, and it aims to inform the public about some of these important species and the conservation efforts to protect them. Take a look. I grew up in Worthington, Ohio, and I think it was a great place to grow up, to connect with nature. You know, with the metro parks being so prevalent in the city, the Columbus Zoo being right there. That's something that I really think shaped what I do now, is being able to go out and find wildlife and explore. My name is Justin Grubb. I am a science communicator. So I do wildlife filmmaking, wildlife photography, I write articles about wildlife conservation, I do photo galleries, and that's always been the focus, conserving wildlife. So my background is in wildlife biology, going out and taking data, doing population viability analysis, but while I was doing all that, I sort of realized that there was another element to conservation as well. And that's the storytelling, that's the connecting with people. You know, working with the general mass public and getting them to understand how they impact the environment and these species. Because conservation really is a people problem, you know. The animals didn't do anything to get themselves in this situation. It's what people have done to the environment. And in order to change that environment for the animals, you have to go to the root cause, which is the people. And so by doing that, you know, I really got into photos, I really got into video, I really got into writing. My love is wildlife. I show that love through education, and I educate through visual media and storytelling. We're sitting at the Grange Insurance Audubon Center and on the walls here is a photo gallery called Conservation Through a Lens. Having Justin who is known for his work with National Geographic is just um, I think it's a surprise for Grange Insurance Audubon Center to have him here and we're very excited about uh, what his artwork does and how it connects to the bigger stewardship and conservation. When you look at the center you'll see photos along the walls that all depict animals that have very unique interesting conservation programs, initiatives, strategies associated with them. There's the Hall of Threatened Species which each photo depicts its own conservation initiative. But then we've got, you know, the Forgotten Wolf, which is an entire sequence of photos that describe um, a single conservation initiative from start to finish. And then there's the Planet Indonesia Gallery, which talks about how 
An organization in Indonesia is doing conservation work through um, community development, which is a really unique strategy that I think should be adopted more around the world. People really connect with a good story. And so with these photos, they all kind of convey their own little story. You know, you're getting a snapshot of the animal's life through their eyes, in the moment, in their environment, behaving naturally. And as a photographer, I live for those moments. It feels like everything just is still on Earth, and the only thing that matters is you and this animal, and you're just trying to capture the moment as it happens. One of the most exciting things I'd say about the gallery is its interactiveness. Each photo has a little card next to it that explains its range, um, the conservation project associated with the image, but also has a QR code that allows you to connect to a website called Conservation Through a Lens that has more details about that animal. You can read more about the initiative and you can even donate to the initiative if that's your thing. But there's also other really cool elements to this gallery as well. There is a, a section where you can draw an animal and contribute to the gallery. We'll also have a couple film screenings. And there's something that I built called Beyond the Lawn. It's a biodiversity survey where people can learn how to like convert their lawn into usable wildlife space. No matter where we are in this world, we live on this world with animals, insects, plants and other things and what we do affects how they live and oftentimes we don't make that connection and so I'm really excited for people to see the beautiful work and how he captures it and learn about how they can help make a difference in what we do as humans to help not have those animals become extinct. Bringing my work back to Columbus is really exciting. This gallery brings in a very global perspective on conservation and so you know, you're seeing animals from all around the world, varying conservation initiatives to help protect them from various threats. But everything that you'll learn about is applicable to what goes on on a small scale, like Columbus, Ohio. And so that's one thing that I want people to walk away with is everything is very interconnected. And what you do locally has a huge effect on global biodiversity. Columbus is an art-rich community, and I'm just, I'm just excited to see what else is down the pike, because I think there are a lot more Justins out there. You can learn more about Justin Grubb's work at runningwild.media. For decades, the rubber industry attracted dozens of companies and thousands of workers to Akron, Ohio. Many of those jobs are gone now, but the city's heritage has inspired an artistic tribute to those workers. Here's the story from WVIZ. At the turn of the 20th century, Akron became the fastest growing city in the country. Fueled by the rubber industry, it doubled its population, with tire companies like Goodyear, Firestone, and General establishing their headquarters in town. To honor the contribution of the men and women who worked in the factories, the City of Akron and the Akron Stories Initiative are installing a statue celebrating their heritage. It started in 1876 when a group of, of local Akron business leaders enticed um, the B.F. Goodrich Company to establish itself in Akron, wooing to get them here because, the, because um, carriage tires were becoming in demand. And it wasn't long after that that uh, Goodyear and Firestone, right around the turn of the 20th century, um, followed suit. And then in the early 20th century, General Tire um, joined them to become sort of the big four of the American rubber and tire industry. The so-called Big Four produced a variety of products. Tires were the main product and, as, and with the explosion of the automobile, but they also made um, other parts for cars, belts and hoses, 
uh, during the war, the rubber companies were a huge part of the war effort. They made rubber rafts. They, they made blimps, which were observation balloons. They made life vests. Goodrich um, expanded into other products. So Goodrich was making golf balls and shoes and all of these other rubber products. And so there was, you know, if it was made of rubber, it was made in Akron, pretty much. The boom led to spinoffs of other local businesses. There were businesses that supplied um, the, the, the carbon black that makes tires black. There were businesses that supplied the chemical that makes the white ring on the sides of the tires. There were businesses that built tire building machines, um, you know, all manner of, of um, support to the manufacturing part of the industry was taking place here. At its height, more than 130 different rubber manufacturers operated in the Akron area, employing 85,000 workers. Two thirds of all tires produced in the U.S. came from Akron. The city became known as the rubber capital of the world. My mom worked at Mohawk Rubber for a little while in the 50s as a single mom, you know, and so I would say that the rubber companies were so instrumental in providing a, uh, well-paying jobs for families so that they could then lift their families up. The tire factories employed people in every aspect of the manufacturing process from the beginning of the process where the chemicals were, uh, were mixed in a hot, filthy room, um, really terrible jobs, but those led all the way up through a hierarchy that ended with the tire builders themselves who were known as kind of the kings of the of the rubber industry. They were treated like royalty. They were the highest paid jobs. They were the most desirable jobs. However, it wasn't a glamorous way to make a living. The hours were long and the work was hard and dangerous. People had to scrub their houses because of the smoke. You know, the stench was terrible. Um, kind of like the First responders now, they had to go in their basements and wash down before they even come in the house because of the lamp black that they use as the basis for the tires was so uh, in their, you know, in their skin and in their, you know, just it stuck to everything. In the 60s, the rubber industry declined. Of the big four tire companies, Goodyear is the only one still headquartered in town. Today, vestiges of the industry remain, but recognition of the factory worker has gone overlooked until now. We have statues to rubber people that started the companies. Of course, we have Stan Hewitt. We have a lot of things that draw attention to those that actually were the heads and started all the businesses. There's a Charles Goodyear monument downtown. There, there are, and there are other kinds of monuments to the to the founders of the companies, to the people you know who made the money, the big money. But there isn't really a representation of the common person who really represented what tire building was to Akron. I think this is just um, such an appropriate and, and long needed uh, uh, contribution to, to the city and, and, and recognition and the lives that were kind of devoted to that industry. To pay tribute to the people who kept those factories humming, the Akron Stories Initiative was created the group's mission is to collect, document, and archive Akron's past. Together with the city of Akron, they spearheaded an effort to erect a statue honoring the rubber industry workers. I think it's, it's entirely appropriate. It's kind of like, it, it reflects the craft of the worker, and I, I think it's a great monument to an important part of Akron's life. The artist tasked with sculpting the statue is Alan Cottrell, his challenge was to create a sculpture that represents every man. We don't know who this worker was. It's sort of like the, the quintessential image of the worker, um, the, the person, you know, the, that, that person represents scores, countless tens, if not hundreds of thousands of people whose lives were devoted to that kind of work. Stories from Akron rubber workers are also being collected and shared on a kiosk by the University of Akron. An announcement of the installation date in downtown Akron at South Main and Mill Streets is expected soon. You can learn more about the sculptor who created the piece honoring rubber workers at alancatrill.com.
He's certainly an artist, but he doesn't sculpt or paint or write or compose songs or poems. He's a tube bender. That's the term for someone who creates the lights in neon signs. From Reno, Nevada, here's the story of how Ken Hines lights up the night skies. My art is hot glass, electrodes, and neon gas. And fire is my paintbrush. My name is Kenneth Hines, and I am a neon tube bender. I've been doing neon in the Reno area for 38 years. I am the last full-time neon tube bender in Northern Nevada. Neon tube bender is a craft that you take a glass tube and you shape it to a specific pattern. Then you put cold cathode electrodes on each end, pull a vacuum on it, and backfill it with neon or argon gas. The term neon is the red neon gas. The majority of reds, pinks, oranges are neon gas mixed in with the other color phosphorus in the tubes. Argon is a blue, a little drop of mercury goes in and there's fluorescent phosphorus in the tubes and that's what makes the colors with the argon and a little drop of mercury vapor. I have a fire that's adjustable up to 16 inches and I have a blow hose that I keep in my mouth at all times. So when I make a tight bend, it collapses and then you just give it a little puff of air and blow it back out to the original diameter. Hot glass looks cold so you've got to be very careful with that hot glass because it burns down to the bone. And getting cut with glass, it really bleeds a lot because it makes such a clean cut. We do deal with high voltage as well. Pretty serious things, but you, you get used to it. You, you're mindful of it all the time. It's about a 10,000 hour process to really learn it, to really get it good where you can do anything that comes in the shop. When we go to create a neon sign, the first step is design. Somebody says, hey, I'm interested in a neon sign. So what we do is we put them in contact with a designer, Dennis, and Dennis is an old sign painter that started in the vinyl business when the computers came out, and I went to him to make patterns for me years ago and we've been good friends for the last 25 years. I will make a pattern for Ken in reverse. He will bend all the tubes. I will create a cabinet out of acrylic or whatever we are doing the cabinet from. When the neon is completed, Ken and I will put everything together on the cabinet and then we will wire in the transformers to complete the project. Nowadays, we've been actually including remotes for the neon so people can actually turn them on remotely without having to go up to the sign. We not only create new neon signs, we do restorations as well. This sign right here, the dice, they're a flag mount, which means that they're hanging out over the sidewalk. You can see it from both sides. They were originally displayed on the Paradise Motel in Sparks across from the Plantation Casino. It got taken down, so I stripped them and had them powder coated and totally rebuilt all the neon, new transformers, put it on that piece of expanded metal and hung it on the wall. And it's been a, quite the conversation piece for a couple years now. I've been a graphic designer for about 40 years now and neon is my passion these days. I love designing neon and seeing it come to fruition. Working with Neon is quite unique because it takes me to a place where I'm really happy with what I'm doing. It's not like work. I enjoy the creativity and the finished product and the satisfaction of creating these beautiful pieces that people will have in their homes or in their businesses for years to come. I think people expect to see it, especially in downtown Reno or downtown Las Vegas. It's just part of the overall awe when you're driving down a highway or, a, or an old road and you see a bright neon sign in the distance, it's kind of alluring and it kind of attracts you.
Neon's been around for about 100 years, and Ken and I are working hard to keep that art form alive and well in Reno. We just want to keep it going. To bask in the glow of neon closer to home, visit the American Sign Museum in Cincinnati. Learn more at americansignmuseum.org. We'll close tonight with our Broad and High Presents segment. We're featuring another participant in We Amplify Voices, a project that fostered collaboration between incarcerated women, their children, and musicians and producers. Here's Carly Frattiani. Days I'm just so tired And I don't know why Seems like everywhere I look There's just another gray sky I've got all these good intentions But I just can't seem to get it right I got to keep on trying Got to keep up the fight There's no time for looking back Gotta hold on to the hope we have In spite of all the hurting I know that we can make it through Just leave your hesitation Cause there's nothing we can do Nothing we can't do Some nights I drift away And I can't explain The way I feel inside I just can't say But I know we've got each other in it all Gets me through the day Even when we fight I know we're always gonna be okay There's no time for looking back Gotta hold on to the love we have In spite of all the hurting I know that we can make it Just leave your hesitation Cause there's nothing we can't do We're making our own way A little more every day Cause there is nothing we can't do And And Gotta hold on to the hope we have In spite of all the hurting I know that we can make it through Let's just leave your hesitation Cause there is nothing we can't do No, we're making our own way A little more every day Cause there is nothing we can't do Well, that's our show. You can find all of our stories, including our feature on the We Amplify Voices project, online at WOSU.org, as well as on our free WOSU mobile app. For all of us here at WOSU, I'm Kate Quickle. Thanks for watching. I'm a poet lost in rhyme, searching for the words to reach you. I'm a dancer out of time, struggling
struggling with the moves to please you like a child lost in the dark shadows on the wall begin to loom like a desert hot and stark i could use the rain to make me blue i'm a Celia C. Peters, film and visual art. I'm a science, math, theoretical, physics fiend. My art is bold, colorful, and geometric. It's science fiction. I love building characters and their worlds. I love the process of putting a story together visually, getting a polished film from raw materials. I'm inspired by the very diverse, very unpredictable Midwestern sensibility that lives in the arts community here. Ohio artists are notorious for being insanely innovative and they go for it in every conceivable way. I'm Celia C. Peters, film is my art, and there's no place I'd rather make it. Production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing culture, and connecting the community to artists, events, and classes at columbusmakesart.com. From these contributing sponsors and viewers like you, thank you 